All right? For the past four weeks, and I want to pray in just a moment, for the past four weeks, this is the fourth one, we've been talking about the Bible. Now, week one, we talked about the reliability of God's Word. And I told you that I find the Bible to be reliable and true because I find Jesus to be reliable and true, because he found the Bible that way as well, and because I follow and love Jesus, that it expands my life, it opens up all parts of my life, and I give him and it control. That was the big idea. All right. Now, in all of these, there is a depth, a deep dive that you need to take that's even further. All right, so keep that in mind. We're hitting the big ideas. Week two, I talked about relevancy. And one of the things that I said is one of the ways that we make or it helps us make the Bible relevant for us today is when we look at it as a story. We don't pick and choose the little pieces that make us feel good or the memes or the, the little Twitter blurbs or the nice little things. That's fine. But we can't look at it as a whole that way and then get it, you know, uh, make it relevant for us. You need, we said, to know the story, enter the story. The story enters you. And here was the big key, most important part, because everything is always coming back to Jesus. Don't ever forget this. Jesus is the main character of the story. It's not you. If you make it all about you, then it's not going to be very relevant because a lot of stuff won't make sense. Now, there's a lot there as well. But last week, we talked about authority because I believe in light of those things and lots more that the Bible is the authoritative word of God, right? Because then as I look, and I attempted last week, but there was a lot in there. You're going to have to go back and do a lot of your own work. I said through this thread of the story of God where we have an authority issue, we've seen it throughout history, the history of, that we see in the Bible as well, Jesus addressed it by being a living authority on earth. And again, in light of what I do with the Bible, what he says about the Bible, it still came, came down to that control issue. He has authority, and the idea, the question was, Will you live under the authority of God or apart from it? That's a big deal, a big question, and it has big implications. I'm going to repeat this in just a moment, but the implications, I'm going to add one today in just a little bit, but the implications were authority, I even said controls, that might be a little strong of a word, controls your identity. Whatever you place an authority over you, over you will now say who you are, or at least attempt to. It also, this is a simple one, authority establishes or controls your actions. They'll say what you can and can't do. And then we added to it and said rights, your rights. Now we see this in the political realm as well. That was a big debate that we could have. Who is in authority over you? Will you come under it or will you live apart from it? This week we want to talk about just flat out study. I'm not going to give you you know, ten things to do. I'm going to give you about five, half of that. Um, and I'm not cutting my sermon short because we started late. I'm just telling you. Okay? Brent's up next week. I'm the long-winded one. All right. Get used to it. Okay? <laughs> no, but I want to, I, I'm adding a little piece today because something interesting happened to me on Friday concerning all of that. And then today, again, very practical. On Friday... Um, I came down to the church. I normally don't work on Fridays. Now, once in a while, especially in light of all that's been going on. But what I did is I decided we're signing some papers, my wife and I, um, to refinance our house. And what I said was, because of her job, why don't you, the, the, uh, the people that were coming down, bringing the papers, the notary and all that stuff, come down to the church. It's a lot easier for my wife and for me. We'll meet you here. Let's do it here at the church. So I did. It was about 4.30 by the time I'm sitting in the office with them waiting for my wife because we got there early. Um, and there was these two gals, these two women, and myself waiting for uh, my wife to show up. The phone rings. And I, I debate to myself, should I answer that? So it's not my day to work. I don't like answering the phone anyways. It's probably a solicitor. Someone's got some car warranty thing they want to do or Bitcoin they want to sell me or whatever, you know. But the two, the two women were talking, and I just, I just I answered it. And this guy goes, 
hey, do you got a minute? I got a question for you. He goes, I'm just randomly calling churches. I don't even think the guy lives in the valley. He goes, I've never been to your church before. I got a question for you. Now, he doesn't start with the question. He just starts going into this, the Bible. I thought that was very interesting. I'm doing a series on the Bible. I should have just said, listen to my past three teachings. Show up today or watch online, and that will answer all your questions. That wasn't going to work. But he started laying into me about, really, reliability infallibility, I mean, and a lot of stuff about the Bible that wasn't, because he said, I said, well, what's your question? And he goes, it'll just take a minute. And I told him, that is not a question that takes one minute. This is a conversation we need to have. But I let him talk for a little bit and uh, said, hey, listen, it's a great, I asked finally, what's your question? You know, in a nice, kind way. And, and he just said, hey, listen, if the Bible isn't true in one part, then it's a house of cards, he called it, and it all falls down. And I'm like, I don't agree with that, but I don't have just a quick answer. Like, you already know this because I said it before. The answer isn't, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, and we walk on. That's not the best answer. And he obviously has something that he's considering. He's read studies from Princeton, he said, and he just started going in. I finally had to stop him and say, hey, what's your question? Well, again, if... This one part is wrong, then it's all wrong and fake. He goes, I don't necessarily believe that, but I don't know. And I said, wow, that is a great question. I would love to talk with, with you about it, but I can't right now. <laughs> and uh, I said, let's talk on Monday, or if you want to call me during the week, whatever. And so we kind of made a little bit of a plan. That wasn't the great part to me, though. Here was the great part. This is where I want to pray and then actually get into the sermon, okay? The two women were there and had stopped talking. I didn't know that until I turned around. And one of them, it was kind of funny, she said, what was the question? <laughs> you know, I wanted to go, it's none of your business. But No, I didn't do that. The other lady did, though. Hey, that's not, you know, it's not our business. And I said, actually, it's not a personal thing. You know, there's no names to give or nothing. And I told them it was about the Bible. And the question was, is it true or not? And the lady went, that's a great question. Now, I don't think her friend wanted to have anything to do with Christianity at that moment. I mean, she had a job to do as well. This gal was training, so it was really cool. And she's like, well, what did you say? And I'm like, listen, <laughs> this is a conversation to have. But I gave her just a quick rundown of what I believe about Jesus. These things matter. They are important. Because it has to do with your identity. It has to do with your actions and your rights. And it has a lot to do with our life as a whole. And what authority you're going to come under. It can change things. So it was awesome to go, hey, I know we got another thing we got to do. But wow, that's important. So it's one thing with the guy on the phone, but that right there was awesome. So here's my prayer, and I want you to pray with me right now. God, would you touch not only the gentleman on the phone, but would you touch both women that sat at that table who also heard, now that's a great question. May your Holy Spirit go in and touch their life. Not to real, reveal something about a book, but to reveal Jesus himself. Amen. All right. Would you continue to pray that? Not only for them, but for those in this world that are seeking truth and longing for something more, especially in these times that we're in. All right. Now, get out your notes if you got them, your Bibles if you have them, your iPads, your phones. Pull up a Bible. Let me recommend one now. I'll come back to it in a little bit. If you don't have a Bible, if you were looking for something on your phone, I'd do YouVersion. It would be my recommendation. There's a lot more on there. YouVersion has a Bible app. It can be on your computer. But there's a lot of incredible material. I'll mention again in just a little bit. Utilize it. There's a lot more as well. I can recommend some stuff. I love to eat. Now, a lot of you, if you've known me for a long time, you've heard this before. I love to eat barbecue, all right? 
So if you're just giving away a brisket this week, I'm your man. Not a piece of the brisket, the whole brisket, all right? Smoke it first, get it all ready, all right, and then give it to me. I watched this show. I actually have already watched it. I rewatched it because I loved it. And it is a uh, show, oh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the show is called, oh, now I'm forgetting. I didn't write it down. Some chef. But it's a, it's a, the whole thing is about these individuals that um, barbecue, all right? And they pull out one person at a time. The first one is, uh, that I watched just even last night again, she is 85 years old. She's a pit master for Snow's Barbecue in, I believe it's Lexington, Texas. This woman, her husband has passed away. One of her kids have passed away. She is still living and barbecuing every weekend. She works all week at the local high school as a janitor. But on Friday night, her alarm goes off at 1 a.m. She drives to the barbecue place, gets there by 2, and starts prepping all the meat. Because I can't believe this, at 8 a.m. on Saturday, there's already a line at Snow's ready to eat brisket, smoked chicken, turkey, wing. Okay, I'll just stop there, all right? It is amazing. She talks about her story. The beauty of the show, if you watch it, um, is it's not just about barbecue, but it's the process to get to the place of enjoyment. I love that piece. I have a friend that is recently moved, but he makes all sorts of things. He makes his own coffee and beer and barbecue, and he, he roasts and and then he makes his own machinery to do those things. I loved when he lived in town going out and helping whatever he was doing. Part of it was because the process we would go through to enjoy it. And the other part was the whole experience of being together and talking. When you watch this show, her name is Tootsie. And Tootsie, this 85-year-old woman doing some hard labor so a community of people can enjoy some great food. She puts in a lot of time and effort, and she will even talk, it's interesting, about the healing process that she's gone through to get to the place of enjoying what she's creating. Now, there's a lot there to dig into, but I love the show. I love watching, she even talked about, like, some of the smokers don't have temperature gauges on them. It's crazy. She wouldn't even know. She goes, she's become so familiar with it that she touches the smokers and can tell if it's the right temperature or not. I mean, she is in to barbecuing. I love it because then there's just the beauty of seeing a brisket come out of the smoker and unfoiled and, oh, my mouth's watering. I think I was smiling the whole show, just like, I, I'm just longing to be there. It's on the bucket list of places to go. Psalm 34, 8 says this. You're familiar with it probably. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Ah, I love it. Piece, if you look at it and translate it, is to savor it, to savor it, to eat it. It's a process. It's, and then it, it says to distinguish between two foods. So the taste element is to distinguish something, to savor something, to choose something, to experience something. When you add that C part where it says taste and see that the Lord is good, that means to examine, to understand, to inspect. Now, that'll fit for food and barbecuing, and it even fits more for God's Word. The encouragement today is to taste God's Word and to see, to examine so that you can understand, to inspect 
what he says, who he is, and what he says about you. Now, let me talk a little bit. This is very practical today. Why would we study the Bible? These are some big things that you can dig a little deeper into. And the one big idea is it's for spiritual formation. It's in your notes. It's up on the screen. Spiritual formation. Now, here's what it's not, just real quickly. It's not looking for a spiritual high. So one of the things that we don't want to do with God's word is look at it and now expect a certain feeling about it. Have you ever read God's word and you're just like, eh, I do sometimes. Or sometimes there's not even something that I'm supposed to feel good about. Because to be honest with you, it can be very depressing, discouraging, there's lament, there's poetry, there's all this. When we read God's word, we're looking to be spiritually formed, not to create some feeling. And yet, there is feeling involved. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of times when I leave reading God's word and I'm like, wow, that hit me right there. Or there was a time, like I left Friday experiencing something, God's word and what he was doing, and it left me with a good feeling because of how they felt. But we don't look to it to get a spiritual high. It's also not something that we always look at to fix our problems And though it helps us with aspects of freedom. So sometimes we do go to God's word to try to fix something or get an answer. But it's not the only reason you go to to the scriptures to see what Jesus said to fix my problem. Because a lot of times you're not going to get your problem fixed by just reading some words on a page. It goes much deeper than that. It's also not looking for information. But we believe that God's word is about transformation and spiritual formation. In fact, our mission here at Journey Church is twofold. One, I want more people to find Jesus. So the guy on the phone, the two women at the table on Friday, you know what my agenda is and desire? is that they find Jesus. My prayer is that they find Jesus. Not through the words that I say, but the power, the living, active word of God into their life, the Holy Spirit, just uh, consuming them, speaking to them, and that they find Jesus. But two, the other part of our mission is that people would be formed into the likeness of Jesus. By Jesus. To find and be formed. That's our mission. This growing process. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 is one of the many scriptures about Scripture says, for the word of God. Everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. I love that. The idea is that you and I, who follow Jesus, would be formed in the likeness of Jesus. And if we believe about God's word, what Jesus says about God's word, then it's even more powerful. And it says that it gets down into the marrow of bone, the innermost beings, that it's active and living and working and moving. Now that's important for us. Romans and many other places will say things like this. God knew his people in advance. The idea of reading God's word, it's not to get a good feeling to fix all my problems. It's not just to get some great information or learn a little history. Although all that has a part to play in it, it is to be formed into the likeness of Jesus And have our lives transformed by the power of his word. This matters. Jesus and the writers showed that it was important. And I already told you this. I want to add one thing to it. It matters. Why? Because it has to do with your identity. 
if you believe what the world or leadership or your boss says about your identity, sometimes you're going to go the wrong direction. It's going to destroy you. In fact, some of you, one of the biggest problems might be it's what you tell yourself about you. But what if you start believing what God says about you in his word? Identity is key. Two, I told you it has to do with your actions. What you do, it matters, makes a difference. And your rights, what you have the right to do and the right to become and who, who God says you are, those matter. Let me add this fourth thing. This matters big time. It's that it matters for our future generations. It matters because our kids matter and their kids matter. Should the Lord tarry and not return soon, which is possible, I don't know when he's coming back, it is going to make a difference in the lives of kids. As authority continues to get shaken, as questions come up about the word of God and right and wrong, it matters what we teach our kids about the Word of God and what Jesus said about it. That's why we're starting kids' ministry again. That's why it matters that we have quality men and women helping lead that. That's why we're bringing Lisa on. That's why we use a curriculum, at least right now, called Orange, that has a lot to do with God's Word and parents and kids and pulling it all together. It's why youth ministry matters here. Because the future generations matter. So it has a lot to do with identity. And man, our kids need that today, don't they? Actions and their rights. This matters. This was established way back in Deuteronomy. When we were told to repeat these things. Put them on our door frames. I mean, there's principles there to interpret, but it matters today how we continue to instill repetitively into the lives of young people the Word of God. Don't ever sacrifice that. As a parent, it's one of the most important things you can do. If you follow Jesus, the Word of God matters. And what they believe about themselves and God, it makes a difference. All right, so in light of that, here's just some practical things on, okay, here is what we believe about authority, here's about relevance, here's about reliability, all this is going on. How do we study it? How do I read it and study it? I'm giving you some big ideas today, all right? Some principles in your notes, write it down, dig into it later, all right? But number one, we need to read and study the Bible, God's Word, with a posture, a posture of humility and submission. Posture is approach. How am I going to approach God's word? How am I going to enter, we said, into it? Now there's some practical interpretation principles to apply, yes. But the best thing you could do right from the beginning is to have a posture, a position of humility and submission. Humility. This means that when I am unclear I must first notice, so I might enter into the Bible and there's some things I'm unclear about. So I need to notice and pay attention, I do personally, about my biases, my baggage, and any kind of, just to use another B word, beefs that I have with the Bible. I understand going into this, but with a posture of humility, that one, I don't get everything. That Google might not have the answer for everything. That I might have some issues with some things, especially personally. But I enter in with humility so that God can enter back in to my life properly. This means I notice those things. That I do not try to make it fit in to my desires and agendas. This posture of humility says, hey, listen, God, I noticed that I had an agenda. I wanted to make that verse fit for my life, and it's not working, so it's your fault. Humility says, no, I enter in, I understand that, and I come with an open heart and life to allow God to do what he needs to do. Isaiah 66, 2. 
I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. It's an interesting verse. We're not going to dig into it right now. Some of it's hard, but I want you to work in me. So I enter it with a posture of humility. Two, I enter it with submission. Humility, a posture of humility and submission. Submission is doing what, God's, what God says. So humility, I don't have everything, but I come humbly before you. And God, I take this and I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Or at least I'm going to learn what that looks like in my life. That's submission, a willingness to do. James 1.22, many of you are familiar with this verse. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do teacher once said, I only believe the parts of, of the Bible that I do. This is a tough one for me. I read lots of things in the Bible. I check my box every day. But if I'm not practicing what I'm learning, it's not going anywhere. It's just words on a page. It doesn't mean it's not good to read those words, but what if you entered a, with a posture of humility and submission that says, I humbly come, I don't understand it all, and I want to receive all you have, and God, I am dedicated to following you and doing what you say. So here's an application piece for you with that. Slow down and simply do. When I was watching the barbecue show, one of the things that she would repeat many times was that barbecue, a lot of you know this, is a slow process. And we in this world today want everything right now because we can get it right now. Like right now, if I wanted to, I could try to speak and look at Facebook or something like that. I could try to multitask. Would it work for me? No, it'd be a mess. But you know what? I try to do that sometimes. The Word of God is not something you multitask. I want to encourage you, if you want to enter in with a posture of submission and humility, one of the greatest things you could do is just slow down. The Bible isn't something that we try to check off boxes, even though I do it for myself. I'll come and say in a moment, you need a plan, but listen, slow down. Read those verses with intent to simply come and say, God, I... I read this now, not because I'm trying to check the box or get it done, but I want to hear from you. Wow, that would change everything. It doesn't make it easy necessarily, but it would, ever, but it would change everything. Slow down. One of the things I loved in the show too was Tootsie said when she started at Snow's Barbecue, and people started coming in 2000, I believe it was eight. They were voted, I think it was out of a couple thousand barbecue places, as the best barbecue in all of, this is a big deal, Texas. It's a big deal. I'm sure that's fist fights happen, right? Shootouts going on. She said what it did, she talked about it made people slow down, sit. Because now, she said, every once in a while we'd have a little bit of a line, and all of a sudden the day after that came out, Hundreds of people were in line. And it forced us to slow down and enjoy one another. In line, eating food. But if you're in a hurry for something like that, you don't enjoy it. What if you looked at God's word that way? Number two, a very practical principle is when we read and study, we do it with a plan that creates consistency and connection. We already said, and we'll repeat this over and over again at times, we are becoming someone. We are being formed. We aren't instantly transformed and formed necessarily. It's a process that builds relationship. And so it matters that we have consistent spiritual practices and rhythms that expose us and create connection to God and one another. We've read 2 Timothy before that talks about all Scripture is inspired by God and it's useful and then it lists things. You can look at that later on again. 
But one of the things that we're doing is we are entering into study with this idea that we are creating some consistent spiritual rhythms that open us up to connecting with God. And I would even say this, to one another. There's a connection piece that matters. So what's an application for you? So have a plan. I wonder what your plan is. If you don't read the Word of God at all, lots of Christians don't. Maybe that's your starting place where you just go, hey, God, I just want to start reading your Word, period, because I'm not doing it. Coming to church isn't reading God's Word, though it's part of it. I'm talking about something outside of a church community that you do within the church community, but as yourself. So I'd ask you then, what's your plan? I'm not good without a plan. Without a plan, I am a mess. I need a plan. So I wonder this week, could you just grab one practice that you would implement that would help you in the process? What do I mean by that? Read some of the Bible. You could pick out a verse to memorize. You can, it's so easy nowadays, Listen to God's word. Ron, I don't have time. And I would go, do you drive anywhere? Listen. You version, I told you earlier, is a great app and there's many more. Plug it in and play scripture to yourself. That makes it easy. You can listen to things online, but create a plan that in turn will create consistency and connection. What's your plan? Grab one practice, not too much this week, that you could implement. Number three, I want to tell you to, to read it with purpose. To read and study with a purpose. This is now kind of a, a lot to this, depending on where you want to go with it. But the question is, how do I study then? Now, we talked about this, I think, in week one or two. You've got to look at, when you read and study Scripture, the author's intent, the cultural context, and I told you in week two, the overall story of God. Those things are matter. So when you read something, there are times when you come with the posture of humility and submission, that you also need to know the intent of the author, the cultural and historical context, and how does it fit in the whole story of God. Otherwise, sometimes it's just weird. It doesn't make sense. That's important to do. That taste, that's the, the taste piece. I want to savor, eat, and distinguish between foods. Where you start navigating, hey, how does this fit? What does this look like? This is where you're then seeing, where you're examining and understanding. This is where some, you'll read, there's books out there that are great reads. I got one of them by Eugene Peterson that talk about eating the book. Where you begin to examine it, to understand it. And it's important to do... Because sometimes it's like a specific diet that you need at the time. Where you eat certain things for a purpose and a reason. And then there's this. Don't bite off more than you can chew. So even going back to the plan piece, if you want to read the Bible in a year, it's great. There's plans for that. But don't go like this. This is a caution. Don't go, you know what? I really feel guilty. Ron's been saying all this stuff and I don't read the Bible ever. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home today and I'm going to read the entire Bible. I will tell you this. If you could do that, praise God, I applaud you. But sometimes it's just, how about picking out a chapter <laughs> so that you can ingest it properly. I have had... The Heimlich maneuver done on, done on me about three times. My wife says it's because I eat too fast, chew too little, and take too big a bites. And I would say, no, I don't. She's right. I think it's that way with God's word sometimes. Sometimes you can get overwhelmed with it. And I would say, hey, listen. Maybe even this, use resources that fit your current need or desire. So one of the greatest things you can do if you just want something super practical is I would encourage everyone in here to get 
a study Bible. All right? There's a lot of great ones. ESV study Bible, NIV study Bible, KJV study Bible. All translations have a study Bible. What do they do? They got little con condensed versions of the story of God, what that book is about, the author and intent that can help you in the beginning. Most of them all have notes at the bottom, cross-references. They're awesome. All condensed in one nice, beautiful package so that you can chew slowly, enjoy more, and not choke. So I encourage you all to get a study Bible. All right. Two more. We'll wrap up. The other thing that I want to tell you is to read and study with people. So one of the greatest things you could do, yes, you got to do it on your own, but it's best done together. I told you earlier when I was watching the barbecue show, Tootsie said, hey, this brings us together. Don't you find that? Like one of the things that really angers me right now about the pandemic is the lack of ability to go into a restaurant with people. Not by myself, with others. It angers me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. i got to be careful how much I talk about it. Otherwise, we're another, here another half hour just ranting with you and one another. It seems to even go against my theology. My theology says we hug, right? We eat together. We enjoy. We take time. Now, I'm not going to push that onto you, but that's what I desire. I miss sitting down, not going to a coffee shop by myself, but with people. Sitting there, and it's not always about the copy, it's about the experience with one another. One of the greatest things you could do is be part of a community of people that are studying the Word of God together. So the senior adults are here on Tuesday mornings. They're going through one of the hardest books in the Bible, Revelation. They've been tackling it for weeks. Man, those guys in there, I think it's Larry, is just like with a whiteboard, they're doing graphs and things and handouts and talking about, I'm like, wow, I'm overwhelmed at times, right? It's awesome. There are things online you could still do even though you can't be here. There's a women's group coming down here Tuesdays. Another group's wanting to start here on another night. Youth are coming down here. Kids are going to start on Sunday. You can create your own group. It is important when you read and study the Bible to not only do it by yourself so that you can engage with God, but also with the community of people. It's best done that way. Acts 2, 42 through 47, but only verse 42 says this. All the believers devoted themselves, what? To the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper that we'll do in just a moment, and a prayer. That's how the church started. We're going to start the book of Acts next week. That's important. Sundays is part of it, yes. But even more, I encourage you to be part of some group, online, in person, or create one yourself. There's groups you can join that are doing Bible studies, again, online. Acts 17, 11, Paul and the guys are ministering to people. And they came into contact with the people of Berea. And it says they were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. And they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Hey, I encourage you, again, application, join or create a group online. There's sites online, live in person. I got a men's group on Thursday mornings. And sometimes our conversations are, yeah, they're all right. And other times they are awesome. I've learned a lot from these guys. And we've started a thread online with guys that don't even come but are part of that text thread. And it's fantastic. Encourage you to do that. Worship team's coming. Here's the last thing that I want to tell you today. And that is this. We read and we study with Jesus. This is best done when you come and approach God's word to do it in connection and cooperation with the Spirit of God. I love what Tootsie said. Tootsie was asked towards the end of the show, don't you love that name too, Tootsie? I just want to say it a bunch of times. Make sure you're awake. <laughs> she says this, because they asked her about, like, barbecue. They were talking about something. I don't even remember the context completely. But she said, there's no secret sauce. There, there is, like she said, all I put on this meat is salt and pepper. That's it. 
She said, you know what the secret is and what the show reflected on? The secret is the pit master. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is a pit master, but at the same time, it's a great application for me. When you approach God's word, there is no secret sauce. It's Jesus. I wonder what it would look like to have a meal with Jesus. Revelation 3.18. Would you stand with me at the same time? Read this last portion of scripture. Revelation 3.18. says, look, I stand at the door, this is Jesus speaking to the church, and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And this is my favorite part. And we, what does it say? We'll share a meal together as friends. Yeah, I do imagine that Jesus and I sit down every week and we have brisket together. <laughs> now I know it's not actually meat, but it's his word. I wonder what it would look like for you to listen to him today and open the door. Not just today, but this week. What would it look like for you to sit down and share a meal with Jesus? I would encourage you that it's some of the things that we have talked about this morning and over the past few weeks. And there's a lot more that we can open up and discuss. But... And I wonder if you reflected on what it would look like. I wonder if then you would maybe notice where you need the most from him, but also then apply something that he's speaking to you about. So maybe it's that. Hey, I just want to spend a little bit of time with you this week, and I want to sit down and share a meal with, with you so you can't come and be in a hurry. I want to enjoy something with you. If you'd get out your communion if you have it today. we got a couple songs to wrap up. When they're done, I'll say a quick prayer for us to go. But this definitely is no meat involved in this. But it is a retelling of the story of Jesus that we do often here. And in a sense, it's a meal that we share together with Jesus as friends. And that now we share with one another. When we do it, we're retelling the story of Jesus that says, hey, Jesus, thank you. The word of God is all about you, and, and you are the main character of that story. And we know that you came to earth, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, showed us how to live and love, gave us rights, showed us how to act, and gave us a new identity. When he not only lived, but he died. He paid the price for our sin so that we could be called children of God, so that we have the right to do what he said in Revelation. Hey, Ron, open your door. Let me come in. I want to sit with you as friends. Ah, that's identity, actions, and rights reflected in this. And he didn't stay in that grave. The story of God goes, and we reflect upon the fact that he rose from the grave to give us those rights. So today, you're kind of practicing what we just talked about. This is a little moment of sharing a meal with Jesus. In just a second, you can take it while we're singing, and then uh, you, can, you can just pause and reflect a little bit upon what the song is saying, um, what God is trying to speak to you, some scripture that you heard, whatever it is, I encourage you to do that. So Father, thank you. Jesus, for your love for us, for your life that you showed us, how to live and how to live abundantly, freely, the identity that you give us to be called your children, to be called your friend, that came because of what you did, 
that you died on the cross for our sins so that we could have those rights. And thank you for your word, the living, active word that digs down deep into the marrow. We even today come humbly before you, willing to submit to what you say to us. So thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as we're singing, take time to take communion as you will. And uh, when they uh, are done, I'll say a quick prayer. Please.
chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer child of God.
child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. What a great song to remind us of our identity. It's what Jesus came for, lived for, died for, rose from the grave for, and is coming back one day to take us home as his children. My prayer is uh, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. It's a reminder, the writers write, and they say, we didn't make up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus. And I pray like they declared there that They say, we saw, and I pray that you see this week his majestic splendor with your own eyes. Through his word, through other people, through his work. I pray that you hear his voice. And that you experience him. That you gain greater confidence in him because of the message that was proclaimed by the scriptures, by Jesus himself. May they become words that are like lamps shining in dark places of your life, of our life, of our community until Christ, the morning star, returns. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Have an incredible week. You will not be afraid when you